This video contains major spoilers, including the ending for Yakuza Like a Dragon, so if you intend to play the game, I recommend you don't watch this video until you have. Yakuza Like a Dragon was without a doubt my game of the year for 2020. Actually, I'd go even further and say it's one of my favourite games of all time. I wasn't too familiar with the Yakuza franchise when I got the game, and hell, I'd even call it an impulse purchase. I just wanted something to play during what felt like a quiet end to the year, but I was astounded by how much joy and fulfilment I got from this game. I can now confidently say I'm a fan of the series as it pushed me to go back and achieve 100% completion for Yakuza 0, and buy the other main titles. This was probably a weird way to get into this franchise, however, because Yakuza 7 takes a massive turn away from the rest of the games, with a change of protagonist and switch from real-time to turn-based combat. Huge risks were taken, but they paid off immensely, which doubles my respect for it. Even having only experienced the first half of Yakuza 0 beforehand, I was able to appreciate the latest instalments so much more. It has many incredible moments that only really work if you've played at least one or two of the other games, but it's written in such a way that you can still understand the story even if you haven't. I still can't stop thinking about the game despite finishing it weeks ago. I can't help but put the disc back in and simply hang out in this amazing virtual world. Hours pass by without me noticing, which is always a sure sign for me that I have absolutely fallen in love with the game. To be honest, I'm afraid of covering games I'm this passionate about, because I'm never sure if I can do it justice. But there was no way I could keep it to myself. Yakuza Like a Dragon is just that fantastic. During the brief window of normalcy at the start of 2020, I was able to visit Japan. I mainly stayed in Tokyo, but I also spent time in Kyoto and Osaka. And if you know about the settings of the Yakuza games, they're based on real locations in Japan. Like how Sotenbori is inspired by Dotenbori in Osaka, and Kamurocho is their version of Kabukicho in Tokyo. This is one of the reasons I was tempted to buy the game, along with my best friend's recommendation. I wanted to walk the streets of Japan again, see the glowing neon signs and squeeze through the narrow alleyways. But what I didn't expect was the surprising level of depth that these environments had, that made it feel like these districts were living, breathing places, effortlessly taking me back to my time in Japan. After completing the game and getting the Platinum Trophy, there was no real reason for me to delve into the combat anymore, so I equipped Harity's Amulet which prevents enemy encounters. I then set off and explored the city streets, with no real goals or objectives in mind, it was during this part of my experience that the amount of heart and soul that was put into this game became clear. Every corner of Isazaki Ijincho, Kamurocho, and Sotenbori is populated with the texture and stories of everyday life. Buildings never seem like they're reused or repeated, and even though they have no purpose to us as a player since they're not interactable, they make these streets feel even more real. It's these ordinary buildings I find so fascinating, and can be explained by taking a look at my favourite Instagram account, car underscore nigh, which is literally a collection of building walls in Japan. The grimy yet satisfyingly organised structure of pipes and cables weave up the walls like industrial ivy. The geometry of these accents is captivating, highlighting all the perfections and imperfections of the facade, which have been weathered by time and everyday life. I would look at the walls in Yakuza 7, recognising the same architecture and features, the parts of the environment I would absorb subconsciously, and now as I reminisce, I appreciate them so much more. Ijincho is split into different districts. The more humble buildings in the bar district and south side of the map are a stark contrast to the hotels and sprawling office buildings in the north. There's the park in the northeast corner, and Chinatown a little below that followed by Kunai Station, splitting these better developed areas away from those such as the homeless camp and brothels in the south. This duality is very significant to the themes and characters of the story. Ijincho is somewhere many of those looked down upon by society call home, while also being a playground for powerful politicians. 
I'll speak more on this later, but the fact that the geography is able to reflect this is fantastic. And it also supports Ichiban's progression through the starting areas of the South to the final areas of the North, as he goes from a homeless nobody to the hero of Ijinjo. One of the first things I noticed during my playthrough was that there were no load times when entering most shops and buildings, making my journey through these areas seamless. And I have to say, being able to walk from a main street and then opening the doors of an intricate arcade in such a fluid motion was so gratifying. These environments are strikingly coherent, and I think that was definitely one of the reasons I felt so immersed. Entering the shops and looking at the food stocked on the shelves was a guilty pleasure of mine. I found a lot of joy in recognising the kinds of things I bought during my runs to 7-Eleven in Japan, together with the clear dissection between the different aisles in the same placement in real life. The magazine rack at the front is parallel to the cosmetics, the drinks and ready-to-eat meals are at the back, and then the finale of the hot food is at the front counter. Even the signs on the floor for queuing up are there. Maybe I'm just weird for being so obsessed with assets, but seeing things I recognised gave me a lot of joy. Besides, how could I forget the most popular Japanese snacks? Stick and Jeffrey. In any case, a game that can get me this excited about looking around a supermarket is clearly doing something right. You can explore the world of Yakuza 7 during day or night, which you're able to switch between in post-game at the survive bar. My favourite place to visit at night was definitely the waterfront at Hamakita Park, closely followed by Isazaki Road. The sight of bright city lights and bustling streets hits you a lot differently now during a pandemic. Although not much of the main story occurs in Sotombori, it wasn't neglected by any means. You can see the iconic shop fronts with their charming intricacies and character, and even people dining on the upstairs floors of restaurants and cafes. The main street is packed with fake food displays and all styles of dining establishments, so I seriously struggled walking down here without getting hungry. Kamurocho is undoubtedly a lot more meaningful if you've played previous entries in the Yakuza series, but even if you haven't, the amount of sites and places you can explore is still inviting and engaging. I loved finding out that I could take the stairs leading up to the back of the batting centre, or randomly going up to the top floor of the Kamuro Theatre and discovering a rooftop garden. Seeing somewhere that is so tucked away yet filled with so much detail gives you immense satisfaction. It feels as though this world isn't bound by the path of the protagonist's main story, and it exists outside of what we personally experience. It's like these environments weren't made for telling Ichiban's story. Instead, his quest serves as a partial insight into the districts he visits, unravelling places and characters that are found within it, and examining the social issues it currently faces. The Yakuza games provide a wide variety of gameplay styles. Each entry not only has the main story section, but there's also the mini-games and sub-stories that go on top of that. The main stories are usually straightforward, it's where you spend the majority of your time beating up thugs and getting embroiled in Yakuza conspiracies. Most of the cutscenes and important characters are contained in the main storyline section, which is filled with outrageous moments and mind-blowing plot twists that make playing these games such an emotional roller coaster. On the other hand, the sub-stories are usually on the more light-hearted side of things, in the sense that you get some really wacky situations and gameplay moments to indulge in. Yakuza 7 has a very memorable selection of them, and I couldn't have been more pleased. These little self-contained plots can range from heartwarming to incredibly silly. It's all so entertaining, because while there is usually an extremely serious main story going on, Yakuza lets itself be a purely fun experience and never takes itself too seriously. It's a game that loves being a game. In my opinion, the stories in Yakuza games come first, and the gameplay is second, which actually strengthens the gameplay by giving meaning to everything you do as Ichiban in these different areas. Instead of having disconnected pockets of gameplay and optional content, you actually feel and see a connection between these people and places, making the encounters you have more meaningful, and by extension, giving the gameplay more weight. Then there are the mini-games, which the Yakuza games are jam-packed with. 
They always manage to include traditional games to play, such as darts, cage batting, gambling, shogi, or mahjong. And I have to say, learning to play mahjong was especially rewarding. They always spice up the games with Yakuza-style over-the-top animations, and it really adds to that special charm. Every title also includes the arcades, which are filled with UFO claw machines and classic Sega games of the past. They're fully playable too, so you can go through and beat the entire collection if you want to. There's even an option to add visual changes such as scan lines and ratio adjustments to make them feel more authentic to the time period you would have played them. And of course, Yakuza has to come with its staple minigame, and the greatest gift to gamers, karaoke. These are essentially just rhythm minigames, but it's so fun to see the characters kick back and let their cheesiest selves loose. The tracks come with music videos, and even give you the option to watch them if you were too busy trying to get a high score. They also always create new minigames unique to each Yakuza entry. Like a Dragon has ones like the movie theatre, where you try to stay awake while being attacked by sheep men who make you drowsy, which was hilarious to me because I often fall asleep during movies. And then there's Dragon Kart, which is a full go-kart racer. It's no Mario Kart, but still a whole lot of fun. They even included storylines for rivalries with the other racers, to add a bit more depth to the minigame and the community surrounding it. It's always nice to see that there are characters in this world that equally participate and care about these things. I really enjoyed the vocational school quizzes, strangely enough. Not only can you boost your stats by taking the tests, but it can also make you feel like a genius or a total dumbass in real life. I was painfully reminded how much I suck at geography and math, but I seem to know everything when it comes to random trivia that will never help me in life. Something else that was added to Yakuza Like a Dragon that I particularly enjoyed was the part-time hero app. This is a replacement for Yakuza's completion points, which previously acted as a 100% guideline. I really liked that it gave me a good excuse to run around and get to know the city, by chasing down missing people, saving innocents from being mugged, looking for lost cats, or taking photos of cappers. And even though they're not part of the main story, the part-time hero and sub-stories really help flesh out the themes and characters of Yakuza. It provides perfectly bite-sized content for if you only want to jump onto the game for a short amount of time. The idea is that it doesn't matter how much ability you have to help, you can help someone. And that can be through beating up some enemies, or maybe just listening to someone, or being an inspiration and setting a good example. Sometimes all you need to do is find someone some toilet paper when they need it most. It's through Ichi's interactions with others we come to understand what it really means to be a hero, and that it's a relative thing. The small things Ichiban does are just as important as the big missions he goes on in the story. An important part of his character is that he believes there is no person and no deed too great or too small. True heroism is all about being there for others. One of the biggest changes to this title in regards to the rest of the Yakuza games was its switch to turn-based combat. Fights can occur as you're walking the streets or in dungeon-type areas, which plays a part in the game's emphasis on being a typical JRPG. Fitting the tone of Yakuza game combat, the moves available in battle were equal parts awesome and outrageous, with some very funny names and animations to boot. Certain moves can be unlocked if you max out your bond level with party members, as well as there being an attack which will include everyone in your team taking part. One of the benefits of playing other Yakuza games is the undeniable hype of seeing Ichiban come face to face in battle with some of the series' main characters. Which is funny, because Ichi and the gang don't really know these people like we do. In fact, he never even learns Kiryu's name. The boss battles and music for these parts made things all the more exciting, with amped up renditions of familiar themes. Another thing I liked about combat was the inclusion of jobs, allowing you to customise your party members' roles in combat. Instead of confining you to one designated job for each character, you can choose between multiple for each person and with plenty of options, most of the time. 
My one complaint with the job system is that the jobs are gender locked, with also very little variation in clothing options for the women in comparison to the male characters. I would have loved to see Sachan wielding a sword, and having something cooler to dress her up in other than a frilly idol dress or a funeral outfit. I loved the fashion choices available for the men, and even the alternate character costumes were great too, which you can have your party members wear even outside of battle in postgame. My choice of party members was largely based on who I found the most likeable, and also who had the best outfit. I was always well stocked with healing items and never struggled with being underleveled during the main story thanks to a little grinding. So the only time I actually used Sachan or Eri in my party was when I needed a healer for the post-game dungeons. It wasn't really an issue for me since I didn't really feel attached to either of them, but a better selection of jobs would have made me more inclined to actually have them in my party. Another thing that was added to Yakuza 7's combat was pound mates, who were people and animals you could call on to perform a move in battle. Some are unlocked through the main story, but there are also some real goodies like Nancy-chan who you can get from a side quest, which is yet another reason to get into the optional content for the game, because who knows what wild character you unlock next. Another part of why Yakuza 7's world is so much fun to explore is because you don't feel alone. It's packed with busy places, filled with people who seem to just be going about their lives. There is also a great warmth you feel in the company of your friends. The game doesn't just add them in as party members to fill in the typical combat roles, but also to expand on one of the game's most important themes, which is friendship. In direct contrast to older Yakuza games, Ichiban never travels alone as the three members you select for your main party accompany you as you wander the streets. You also get the finer details of team members posing with you when you're taking a selfie, and it makes them seem more aware of their environment and feel more alive. Everyone feels like a building block to a wholesome friendship group, with lots of amusing moments supplied through features such as party chat and table talk. Party chat appears in certain locations around the map, giving you a prompt to initiate a conversation with your party members. え、少しはこの町の役に立ててるってことがね。ちなみに背中が痒いって依頼出したらエグゼクティブヒーロー様はちゃんと俺の背中を書きに来てくれるのか。当たり前だろ。痒いところに手が届く素敵なヒーローな
Then we have Sachan, who joins the gang after the storyline about her sister, father, and the sinister retirement home. And we meet Eri as she asks for help with her failing business, and subsequently access the business management minigame. As the story goes on, we meet Jungi Han and Zhao, who are both your enemies at first, but quickly turn into good friends. On that note, it was also great seeing Ichi eventually just hang out with the Ijin 3 as they eat Zhao's cooking, something you'd never expect given their first impressions. All of these characters are given attention with the exception of Eri, who doesn't interact in any of the team or dinner chats. Since she is treated as a secret unlockable character almost completely separate from the main story, she doesn't appear in any cutscenes save for the section introducing her and business management. Even in the survive bar, she just sits in the corner on her laptop, which is definitely a mood, but I fully forgot she even existed sometimes. As such, there is an obvious contrast to how much I cared for the other party members versus Eri, but she is mainly there for the business management minigame, so her exclusion is understandable, although that doesn't lessen how it feels to be disconnected from her. Given that I loved the other characters and had plenty of meaningful interactions with them, I didn't notice her absence that much. But I think that highlights just how important it is to have the ability to build up characters through optional content, learning to understand them more and actually care about them. Speaking of which, the bond level storylines for each character are some of the best side content in the game. In Adachis, we see him trying to make amends for his past mistake of helping to get an innocent man wrongly imprisoned, leaving the man's wife and child behind. Once Adachi found he had an alibi, he tried to get him released, but the commissioner made sure it didn't happen. Sadly, the man eventually committed suicide in his cell, and his wife passed away shortly after. Out of guilt, Adachi sent money to his child for years, feeling somewhat responsible for his father's false charge. However, he did not reveal his true identity in the payments, and exchanged letters with him as he grew up. It's information like this that's completely missable if you don't participate in the bond levels. And in the case of Jungi Han, it even unravels his real name is Yonsu Kim. It goes further into his reasoning for continuing to adopt the identity of the former leader of the Jingon Mafia despite his passing, showing that he wants to help find other members who were left stranded after those events. Every character has their own backstory and something they're dealing with, which aren't all related to Ichiban, but Ichi being the good friend he is, will do anything to help them, and in the same way, they're there for him too. We often see Ichiban reaching out to people in their lowest moments. He helps everyone he can along his path, and in the end, it gains him a loving friendship group that cares for him equally. These aren't just throwaway gestures, and it's worth the extra moment to zoom in on. In terms of optional content, I am a little disappointed, however, in the romance substories for the women characters. Sachan and Eri, and even fairly random characters like Arena, who had little to no background at all, had these substories too. Which felt a bit at odds to me because I really enjoyed the friendship Sachan and Ichi had. And to then have something where it felt like her being a woman meant she had to be a romance option didn't sit right. Most of the women in the game have little to no background to their life story or personality, and it seems that they are romanceable purely because of their gender, which also contradicts Ichiban's attitude, since from what we see of him in the main story, he treats everyone equally and with respect, regardless of their gender. In general, I think it's better to focus on writing a good standalone character rather than focusing on their role as a possible love interest. And that's when you get more interesting characters like Mama and Song Hui, both of whom I really wish were explored a bit more. Now I don't want to make it seem like this was too much of an issue for me, because these romance substories are likely just a homage to Persona 5, another Atlas JRPG property, where being in a romantic relationship with all the romanceable women triggers the same scene. And given that there are other Persona 5 easter eggs, including the soundtrack, I'm fairly certain this was the case. I think the only reason it stuck out to me is because this was all the representation we had for a lot of the women in the game, whereas the men were given a lot more depth in comparison, and just having a more extensive exploration of these women would have benefited the game for me personally. Yakuza 7 very much feels like a love letter to JRPGs, in particular Dragon Quest, which is a game that Ichiban played a lot of during his childhood. It had a huge influence on his mindset, and even how he approaches fights, explaining the use of turn-based combat and enemy transformations. Oh, 
あ,あ何言ってんだお前勇者がどうとか妄想が過ぎるんじゃねえか現実見ろよ無職さんおうおらよ勇者のつもりで戦ってんだよ喧嘩になると頭の中で自然に回っちまうんだよドラクエの世界がうわまたドラクエすかそうだよドラクエだって仲間がいなきゃクリアできねえんだぜんそれってテレビゲームの The minute details of this go further, however, with the loading screen showing typical JRPG character sprites and little anthems playing whenever someone joins your party. The menu at Hello Work, the place where you can change character jobs, plays typical JRPG menu music, and even the appearances of enemies are affected thanks to Ichiban's imagination. Dragon Quest also serves as Ichi's influence to be a hero, and all of this goes to show just how much Ichi was affected by this game in an impactful and positive way. It feels good to be playing a character who loves video games, as someone who also loves them. Another not so subtle JRPG reference would be Sujimon, which is basically just the game's version of Pokemon, as you fill your Suji decks with the different variations of opponents you fight. It's totally ridiculous in the best way possible, with some pretty great descriptions of enemies too. You're also able to plant fruits and vegetables, which can be harvested and eaten or used in crafting. It kind of reminds me of planting berries in Pokemon, and I don't know if that's a deliberate reference, but it was the first thing that came to mind. There are some visual references which I picked up on too, including the possible Final Fantasy VII Shinra building shot with the Millennium Tower, and I can't say for sure, but the Survive Bar could be an equivalent to the 7th Heaven Bar, which also served as a headquarters for the game's protagonists. Overall, it was really nice to see these little tidbits of classic JRPGs sprinkled into the game. I'm sure there's a lot more that I missed, but all these homages and references make Yakuza Like a Dragon feel like a JRPG made by JRPG fans. <laughs> Ichiban Kasuga is my favourite video game protagonist to date. He's one of those characters that you can't help but cheer on every step of the way, and I think there's a lot to learn from him too. Aside from being a lovable and relatable himbo, which may or may not be reason enough for me to adore him, his journey serves as a reminder that your age doesn't determine how you should act or where you should be in life. We first meet Ichiban when he's 23, and then spend the large majority of the game playing as him when he's 42, after spending that time in between in prison. Despite this time jump, Ichiban really hasn't changed at all. He's still steadfast, quick to anger, and true to his emotions. He's no more mature than he was 18 years ago, and it's honestly great. The almost two decades of imprisonment for a crime he didn't commit didn't harden him into a cynic, unlike a lot of the stoic video game men around this age. And I have to say, it's really nice to see an exploration of older characters that isn't super serious and somber. Quite frankly, Ichi doesn't seem to care at all how people perceive him. He's definitely aware of what people think, but chooses to be himself regardless. It's like when Arakawa scolds him for smiling at people passing by, and it's not the first time either. <laughs> Ichiban clashes heads with many, especially the more serious characters like Sawashiro, who have different views on what it means to be a Yakuza member. Ichi has not forgotten his childhood dreams of becoming a hero, akin to a brave main character in a Dragon Quest game. It has forged his outlook on life and combat, and not once has he let that go despite all that he has been through. Ichi reminded me that it's never too late to start something. No matter your age and your social status, you can still learn and progress. There's no expiry date for achieving personal happiness and success. If you need to start all over again from the age of 40, then so be it. There's nothing to be ashamed of. Life can be a hard and arduous journey where it really seems like it's trying to knock you down at any given opportunity. But you got this. 
and even at rock bottom, you can find happiness, likely in the things that a lot of us take for granted. Or maybe even the things we don't notice because we're too busy comparing our successes with other people's, never feeling like our accomplishments are good enough or worth celebrating. But a small win is still a win, and we see that in Ichiban and the gang. The only people Ichiban looks down on are people that are morally low, not socially, which is a stark contrast to the antagonists of the game that I'll speak about later. Having grown up in a brothel and then ending up as Yakuza, he's always been looked down upon by society, and through this, he's clearly learned that someone's social standing doesn't represent their worth as a person. We are all capable of good. Ichiban's story is a roller coaster of emotions. We see his loneliness in prison, and we watch him lose the family and life path he had before his sentence. Yet by the end of the game, Ichiban has a new family, and you get the sense that he won't ever be lonely again. Yakuza Like a Dragon covers a lot of varying themes, such as friendship, family, and heroism, but I was particularly surprised by how it represented homelessness. Ichiban became homeless early on in the game after his body was dumped in Ujicho's homeless camp, with the gunshot wound he received from Arakawa. Thankfully, Namba patched him up, and Ichi realises he can't safely return to Kamurocho anymore, a place he used to call home. This is his lowest point in the game. He has nothing and no one, and it was the other homeless people and lower class of society that helped him on his feet and supported him. It's the people who had very little to give who gave the most. And it's that southern, less affluent area of the map that remains your home for the rest of the game. Ichiban and his friends climb higher and higher, butting heads with some very powerful people, but their financial situation doesn't change. You still have to visit the Hello Work job centre to adjust your team members' jobs, and you still sleep in a small room given to you by the owner of the Survive Bar. Although, through it all, he acquires a kind of wealth more important than money. He has a group of people who care about him. Homeless characters are also treated like actual people with hopes and feelings. There are sub-stories including one where a homeless man befriends a young boy and wants to make him a bookcase as a birthday gift, but he's worried it's not good enough. And then there's another who falls in love with the woman at the soup kitchen, and asks you to be his wingman. These characters aren't dehumanised or only defined by their homelessness. They have the same meaning and purpose just like anyone else, regardless of their circumstances. Yakuza 0 has you literally throwing money away, but Like a Dragon has you scrounging up change from underneath vending machines and collecting plastic bottles. Even in business management, Kiryu could rake in billions of yen straight into his wallet after one collection. But as Ichi, you're only able to take 3 million yen for your pocket after each shareholder meeting. It works well though, because it feels a lot more genuine to be a homeless character and actually feel the effect of their financial position. To be fair, it doesn't restrict you that much, but I definitely found myself more aware of my spending than in Yakuza 0. At the homeless camp, Namba has a really great scene where he tells Ichiban people's reasons for being homeless, as well as explaining that it's not just a case of getting up and finding a job, because for a lot of people they have no choice. They could be putting themselves or their loved ones at risk, and that's why they had to run away in the first place. People's lives are more complex than they may seem, and rather than preaching to them about what they should and shouldn't do, even with good intentions, sometimes it's better to just listen and understand. <laughs> ここに発言家も捜索
Another one of the game's most prominent themes is father and son relationships, which is narratively intertwined with the swapping of Ichiban and Masato at birth. Masato was born from a loveless relationship between Sarashiro and a woman he literally doesn't remember the name of. Yeah, seriously. Unsure what to do and desperate to get rid of the unwanted baby, they put him in a public locker numbered 99, and hoped someone else would find him. It's also worth noting that coin locker babies were a genuine problem in Japan, especially between 1980 and 1999, which is around the time the game is set in. Meanwhile, Arakawa's partner Akane gave birth to Ichiban, although as much as they wanted to live together in peace, his patriarch did not approve of their relationship, and ordered for her and the baby to be killed. Arakawa instructs Akane to place the baby inside a locker and try to escape, and so she does, in Locker 100 miraculously right next to Masato. Arakawa arrives at the lockers, and upon hearing the cries of a baby, starts punching open one of the lockers believing his child to be inside. Of course, it's the wrong locker. It's number 99. You can't really blame him either, because how could he have expected another locker baby to be there? Shortly after Arakawa rushes Masato to the hospital, Jiro Kasuga, the manager of a local soapland, comes and retrieves Ichiban, mentioning that Akane told him of the plan, and should things go south, to go and save her baby from Locker 100. He then takes him in and raises him as his own, as Akane is nowhere to be seen. Fate binds Masato, Ichiban, Arakawa, and Sawashiro together, because even though that day was coincidental enough, they all end up together again under the Arakawa family, unknowing of their blood relations, with the exception of Sawashiro, the only one confirmed who knows the truth. Even though we follow Ichiban's story, the game actually starts with a scene that doesn't include him at all. Instead, we see young Arakawa performing on stage with his father, acting out a story about a woman who searches for her father's murderer, a foreshadowing of Arakawa's own quest for revenge. They're both clearly very close, and unfortunately during what was supposed to be a celebratory meal after the show, his father was assassinated by a young Hoshino. Arakawa and Ichiban have incredibly similar backstories, and both had their future plans taken away from them after dramatic life events. The theatre troupe Arakawa was a part of seemed to be successful, and Ichi thought that his life would belong in the Arakawa clan, but sadly fate had something different in store for them. Arakawa's father died in a jincho, and so did he, and these events repeat themselves as Ichiban is left behind after Arakawa's death, who relentlessly searches for his killer also. And finally, both carry Masato away from those lockers, one at the start of his life and one at the end. Ichiban and Arakawa are shown to have a strong relationship even near the start of the game. Arakawa expresses that he sees Ichi as a son multiple times, and similarly, Ichi sees Arakawa as a father. We see them spending time together on New Year's Eve, looking to share a meal of Peking duck together whereas Arakawa and Masato are never shown together during the present-day events of the game, only in flashbacks, and this shows that Masato has been distancing himself from the family for years. Arakawa never took Masato to have Peking Duck, as Hoshino explains that the first time he had it was with him shortly before his death. Arakawa only ever offered to have it with Ichi, and not Masato, unless he did but Masato declined. His final meal with his own father was the same dish, so it's clearly of great importance to him, and maybe this is his idea of a father-son experience, which only goes to show just how much he loved Ichi. Ichi and Arakawa, and Masato and Sawashiro, both naturally had father-son-like relationships without knowing that they are actually biologically related, although one was clearly more direct and loving than the other. It is revealed that Arakawa would dream about Ichi's birth, so could he have possibly known? ソープの投げ銀行で生まれたんだっけな。え、素晴らしいです。でもすげえ話だよな。俺にはその話がトラウマになっちまってる。え？夢を見るときがあるんだ。夢ですか？ああ。
んなそばが勝負でそんなわけねえのによやめてください恥ずかしいっす恥ずかしいことなんてねえお前は地に足をつけてしっかり生きてる生まれた場所なんて関係ねえ Regardless, Arakawa still loved Masato and Ichi very deeply. Likewise, Ichiban feels the same way about Jiro Kasuga and Arakawa, which is shown in his response to getting a DNA test to confirm his relations. そう言えんのは嬉しいだろうし安心できんだろうやだね俺の親父は二人いんだよえ桃源郷の店長春日次郎と荒川真澄死のつながりがどうのと確かめたとこでその二人が親だってことは何も変わりやしに変えたくもねえそっか<笑> Masato, on the other hand, doesn't care about either of his dads, since, you know, he does give out an order for them to be killed. Despite this, we see snippets of closeness between Masato and Sawashiro, like when Masato immediately calls him after killing a member of another clan, and not Arakawa. Sawashiro also accompanies Masato a lot of the time, and is even tasked with reporting Arakawa's activities to him later in the game. The reason Sawashiro joins the Arakawa family in the first place is to be near his son, and probably feels guilt towards placing him in that locker, which caused him health problems due to hypothermia. The father son theme goes so hard that it completely, and I'd say even purposely, neglects its representation of mothers. Akane and Masato's mother, who, might I remind you, isn't even given a name, are very far from developed characters, to the point where we don't even see Akane's face. The only mother who is shown on screen and we know the name of is Arakawa's mother Yoko, who was abusive and technically the reason Arakawa's father was killed, so yeah, a pretty terrible person to say the least. To me, this is a very strange method of highlighting the father son relationships. And I think this could have been handled a bit better. Besides, the dynamic between the men was more than compelling enough, so it doesn't make sense to try and make that stand out more by crossing out any interesting exploration of motherhood, or even just having a little more depth when it came to Akane and Masato's mother. Now, I understand that the Yakuza series is deliberately written to explore themes of masculinity and the lives of Japanese men, and it does so incredibly well. But I do think some more compelling characters that aren't in that category would actually help supplement the story. I will say this isn't something I picked up on during my playthrough, and I only noticed it once I started analysing themes more extensively for this video. So it's not that I had a serious problem with it, I just think that it would be really cool to see more diverse personalities and stories when it comes to the women in future games. Before going into the significance of Bleach Japan in discussing the societal issues present in the Jincho, it's important to cover Ryo Aoki, otherwise known as Masato Arakawa. I've already explained his birth, but around the time Ichiban went to prison, Masato went to the US to undergo surgery so he could walk, and during this time he also changed his identity. He studied political economics at Harvard, which is where he met Hajime, and together they founded Bleach Japan. Masato eventually left the organization and became governor, and he was able to do this by destroying the Tojo clan using the Kamurocho 3K plan, which essentially tightened anti Yakuza laws and won him a lot of support. He pressured Arakawa into selling out the other Yakuza in Kamurocho so he could achieve this. Although Arakawa did do some dealings in order to secretly help the Tojo clan, Masato's next step for even more power would mean he would have to take over Ijinchō. But he would need to take the seat of the party chair of Citizens Liberal Party, which was occupied by Yutaka Ogikubo, who was the one behind the Ijin 3's counterfeiting enterprise, in an effort to keep the peace. Masato wants Ogikubo's position, and what is basically a power struggle between two men drags the entirety of Ijinsho into this mess. The Omi Alliance backed Masato and Bleach Japan, planning to get rid of the Ijin 3. 
they sent men disguised as Bleach Japan demonstrators in order to invade the Gomijul, and Masato even brought out people like Mabuchi to help with his schemes. As much as he had distanced himself from the Yakuza in public, he still relies on their muscle power to get the dirty work done. Which is of course very hypocritical, considering the whole philosophy of Bleach Japan is to cleanse the grey zones of criminals, so I'm guessing he had just said this to gain attention and supporters too. His success basically stemmed from picking on the lower classes of society and minorities, setting them up as those to blame for Ujinchou's problems. In reality, the government, in particular Ogikubo, was the one who established the counterfeiting scheme in the first place, and Masato brought the Omi Alliance into Ujinchou and ordered people to be murdered. The issue was never the grey zones, it was the people in power. Ultimately, the Bleach Japan front was just a means to an end for Masato, who used it to create a political movement only because he craved power. We know he didn't care about righteousness because he was willing to do underhanded things to get ahead. This fake righteousness was only a form of manipulation to get people like Kume to do his bidding, and the people that actually cared for other humans were the likes of Ichiban and his allies. Masato's own downfall was because he viewed people as objects to be used for his own gain, in turn creating a fanatic in Kume who eventually resorted to killing him. Masato is filled with a lot of hate, mostly towards himself. He was never happy no matter how much he had, he was constantly chasing what he thought would make him most powerful, and any semblance of morals or belief in anything is thrown out of the window for a taste of this power. He looks down on everybody, and has completely lost any empathy he might have once had. ゴミ以下です。なんだと。社会の he blames the people in the grey zones for their own situation and not being able to get out, and I think it ties in very specifically with Ishiban's political speech to Kume while they're on the buses. たすけられたんだ。彼らの全員が望んでグレーゾーンに生きてる人たちに助けられたんだ。彼らの全員が望んでグレーゾーンに生きてるわけじゃねえ。そうならざるを得なかった奴らばっかりなんだ。でもあい
they're both opposites to each other in terms of personality, and even their upbringing and financial situations are extremely different. But it's ultimately the kinds of choices they make that set them apart the most. There's a scene where Masato talks about making sacrifices and breaking rules to get where he is, which is then followed by Ichiban being propelled to the top of the bus by his friends, now facing Masato as an equal. I think it's a good symbol of how Ichiban gets through the world and rises up. He was able to come so close to Masato without using money or doing any of the horrible things that he did. Instead, he got there by helping others, and in turn being helped by them. He was able to run for the election because of the friends he made, and he did so legitimately, which can't be said for Bleach Japan and Masato. Namba and Adachi literally boost him up to the van to stand with Masato eye to eye. Ichiban is literally lifted up by the people he befriends. The most annoying thing is that this hunger for power Masato has stems from his jealousy of the commissioner, who stole his hostess girlfriend. Masato's brief interaction with him all those years ago made him realise he couldn't use his money to control him or bribe him into liking him. It gave him such an inferiority complex that he ended up desperately chasing power through legitimate politics, otherwise referred to as frontal power.何一つ満たされちゃいなかった。あの人は全く別のものを求めていた。全く別のもの。表の力だ。表の力。世の中には金にも薬剤にも従わない人間がいる。その相手を屈服させる者は表の力こそその答えだと。Masato wanted revenge for feeling belittled by the police commissioner 18 years ago, which is insanely petty to say the least. He planned his future with his ex-girlfriend, so perhaps having her taken away made him feel like the one bit of control he had over his own life was shattered, which broke an already insecure man into a power-hungry maniac. Ichiban sums up Masato's downfall perfectly when he faces him in the tower. あんた、もう自分自身でも止まり方わかんなくなっちまってんでしょ。何？知人だって昔自分をバカにした連中を見返して権力者になった。でもそれで何が手に入ったんです？今のあんたには大事な人間もいねえ。あんたのことを大事に思ってくれる人間もいねえ。持て余した権力に目がくらんで、てめえが何を無くしたのかもわかってねえ。ならその先は手にした権力守るために邪魔なもん全部消し続けるだけの人生だ。そんなもん望むほ
この人は俺の数少ない信頼できる刑事仲間伊達誠だお前が春日一番か<笑>噂通りだな昔のあいつと同じような目をしてやがるあいつ俺の大切なダチのことさ Despite their similarities, Ichiban is still allowed to be his own character and not a replacement for Kiryu. Ichi loses his temper very easily and works as a team, whereas Kiryu is more of a cool headed lone wolf type of guy. There's enough difference between them for this change to be exciting, but not too much different, which might feel alienating for fans of the series. In this way, the passing of the torch is a great success, in my opinion. It's not often that I genuinely feel sad when I finish a game, and not necessarily due to the tone of the ending, but because I now know that I can't experience it for the first time ever again. Yakuza 7 is a game that gave me so much joy, and it's definitely one of those games that I played at the right time. Having experienced Japan and missing the company of friends, it felt like a remedy for me. The Yakuza series has a change in tone similar to the Metal Gear Solid series. Where the game can make you cry from a hard hitting emotional scene, and then also do stuff like this. I love this kind of thing in video games. The contrast makes both ends of the spectrum more impactful, and to be honest, the chaos feeds my soul. I feel the love and passion of everyone who worked on this game, and while I do think that there are some areas to be improved upon, It didn't stop my enjoyment for this entry in the series. The characters' environments and story that I experienced were full of life, and the messages I got from this game were actually motivating for me. At the end of the game, Ichiban gives us one last message as he looks down at the trash below, then up to the blue sky. The only way forward is up, but the bottom doesn't have to be all dark and gloomy. Before I end this video, I'd like to thank my friends Corrupted Save, Heavy Eyed, and Foxcade for helping me with making this. It's been a very busy couple months for me, and for some reason I decided to take on a project this big. Without them, I wouldn't have been able to put this video out, so I'm very grateful for their help. They each make amazing content, so please go check out their channels and show your support. I'll put the links in the description. Anyway, thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.